Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about all of life through the prism of food. And this week I'm discussing easy wins with the award-winning and best-selling queen of vegetarian food, Anna Jones. Her latest book is absolutely packed with stunning recipes and ideas for getting so much more taste on our plates. So much of good eating is about good shopping, about good buying. And I think part of easy wins is about having this capsule pantry of different ingredients ready to turn something reasonably simple into something unreasonably delicious. Easy Wins has 125 brand new recipes around 12 hero ingredients, all designed to make our lives easier. But with two small kids to look after, that can't be an easy win for her. I asked her how she does it. Oh, well, that's sweet. Um, Yeah, it is a bit of a juggle, isn't it? I mean, I remember speaking to another food writer who I won't name, who said, oh, when you're, you have tiny, tiny, tiny ones, they kind of sleep um, and sleep and sleep and sleep and you can get loads of work done, Um, which turns out is absolutely not the case. Um, But no, I've done it with lots of help from lots of lovely people. I've got a great husband who's very hands-on um and a nice support network so um that's how I've sort of been able to work and be around for a very small baby yeah well I suppose yes I mean what you talk about you know the golden rules with your 12 hero ingredients are all about getting organized and that is the key to parenting it's the key to life isn't it it's about thinking ahead planning not wasting it, and this means time as far as your children are concerned, but you know, it, it is about that. It's just about being super organised, isn't it? Have you applied your rules of cooking to your rules of parenting? I mean, I really wish I had. I'm I'm not a sort of <laughs> naturally organised person. I think I'm organised in the kitchen because that's my space. That's where I kind of understand everything. That's where my creative work happens. That's where I'm kind of at home. Um, so how sort of recipes work and how a kitchen works makes kind of perfect sense to me. So I'm always organised in the kitchen. Um, but I'm not a sort of much of a forward planner. I think why I love cooking is because it's so instantaneous. You kind of get it, you get it on the plate right then. Um, but yeah, so I've definitely had to sort of work on my forward planning, both, um, you know, in sort of the wider parenting scale and also around sort of meal planning um, a bit too. And I think that is sort of where this book has come from really, because, you know, I, I want a fully stocked kind of, flavor pantry so that I can you know make meals quickly and um you know just be sort of one step ahead I'm sort of getting into that wise woman stage now you know my kids are 28 and 25 and actually and you know I was telling you about the puppies before I'm anxious about how I'm parenting the puppies and it's taking me right back to that anxiety when my kids were like you know five and eight am I am I doing it all right you know trust take just trust I think that's the thing and it is the same in in the kitchen I mean last night we had a fantastic Yemeni supper club two Yemeni refugees um, came and they did this amazing feast and what I noticed there was it wasn't about am I doing it right and you know am I following you know have I made it delicious enough it was all about hospitality it was about giving and I think that that's the thing with parenting it's about life isn't it it's about getting the intention right just making sure that you're, if you're feeding someone, it's because you want to give them some food. It's because you want to nourish them, not because you want to show off. And I wonder in this world of Instagram, you know, everyone's looking to you. You're on a high pedestal there. They're looking to you for answers, aren't they? Cookbooks are really about answers. Um, you know, Yotam Ottolenghi said, this is a peek into Anna's cupboards to find her best kept secrets. I mean, what's that? Is that a bit of a... Is that a bit of a challenge to deal with that kind of pressure? Well, it is a challenge. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so grateful that some of my books have resonated with people and, um, the recipes that I have come up with in my funny little kitchen, um, are loved and remembered and cooked by people for the people they love. That is always going to feel like a piece of real life magic for me. You know, that little girl who sort of used to do little 
cooking demos, um, you know, in my mum and dad's kitchen. The fact that, you know, I get to do this as a job and people cook my recipes is always going to be um, miraculous. But yeah, a lot of this book is kind of about getting organised. It's about kind of simplifying. And I think a lot of parenting has... um, made me sort of simplify my life. I mean, the amount of clothes I wear now are much fewer. I have, I I don't think I'm quite a capsule wardrobe, but I'm not far off. Um, And, you know, I sort of simplified what we have in the house. I've definitely simplified the amount of toys we had since I had my my son who's eight now. Um, Our very little one has, has way less. And I think actually simplifying life a little bit, um, really means that you can sort of be a step ahead. Um, And I think that's where sort of this book came from. So we've chosen sort of 12 ingredients here that I sort of see as a kind of, I guess, a capsule pantry in some senses. And I think that is... um, you know, that that is really getting yourself a little bit ahead um, because you don't have, you know, fathoms and fathoms of stuff. You don't have, you know, great big amounts of ingredients to either go out and buy or to sort out or that run out before you get to them. Um, so that really, I think, is, you know, this book is about simplifying things. It's about making dinners easily and quickly. And I know I'm a cook, I'm a chef, you know, that's what I do for a job. But when I want to put dinner on the table for my family, I'm under the same time constraints. I have 20, 30, 40 minutes um, to get something on the table that everyone is excited about eating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tell me about writing that many recipes. I mean, I looked through the book today. I mean, every single one of them. I mean, I did have the lemon pasta for lunch because I just couldn't not. You know, when you're, you're, you're 12 hero ingredients, you devote a chapter to each of these ingredients and lemon starts. And, you know, lemon is one of those flavours, isn't it? Once you say the word, it's in your head. You have to do something with it. It's, it's, it's just so oh, absolutely addictive. But how do you come up with that many great recipes because they are new, aren't they? They are, obviously, there's no such thing as a new recipe. It's always a riff on something before. But that's what people are looking for from you. They're looking for new ideas that they can take away, not just sort of philosophically about what to do in the kitchen, but actual dishes so that people will say, oh, yeah, I I go to the Anna Jones on that one. Well, I think the one thing I love about my job and I love about food is I don't think you can ever stop learning and you can ever stop um, coming up with new ideas and combinations. I mean, food is so unfathomably large and nuanced and, you know, related to emotion, related to, um, you know, what we've inherited, related to, um, you know, culture and upbringing. And it, sort of all of those things come into um, cooking when I sort of come up with recipes. It's, it's really, um, you know, it, I, when I sit down you know, with a blank page and start off a book, it does feel quite daunting, but there's always a structure. And um, this time I really wanted to write a really generous chapter on each of these 12 hero ingredients, because, you know, what annoys me the most in cookbooks um, is when, you know, you buy an ingredient and then it's used once and then it sits on, you know, the top shelf of your fridge or in your pantry. And then, you know, a year and a half later, or I don't know if you're my mom and dad, five years later, (laughs) (laughs) or 15 years later, you might throw it out. Um, So I really wanted there to be a really generous amount of recipes for each ingredient. And also, I think there's something really, really interesting about, you know, picking one ingredient. You mentioned lemons there. And... um, and then cooking with it lots and lots of different ways. I think there's something in that. I think there's something then that teaches us about cooking, about flavour, about how, you know, that that ingredient reacts in different conditions, um, in different dishes, you know, used different ways. Um, and, 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 and I really love that. I mean, it's interesting, going back to the Yemeni Supper Club last night, uh, one of the things that the, Leila, the, the, the woman who was with Rabab to help her out, she'd just come back from Mecca for a start. But she, the week before, she had done a, a wedding for over 100 people. 
I mean, well over a hundred people. And, you know, she would have, she take, I was watching her, I was watching the, the two of them. They take it very slowly. But the thing is that they know those recipes really, really well. And actually coming up with, how is it 125 new recipes you've, you've got in this book? New recipes for us to go, oh my God, she's come up with even more out of the bag, you know, upping the game all the time. Is that good for us as a food culture? That's a really interesting question because I think food, you know, as I've just said, is 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 a sort of lifetime learning process. I don't think as cooks, as chefs, as people, as humans, you know, we ever stop, uh, th- first of all, thinking about food, craving food, being hungry, um, and we, you know, wanting more interesting, different and diverse food. You know, that Yemeni supper club sounds absolutely um brilliant and i think it's you know i i think that if we're if, if we're getting if we're adding more that gets us to cook at home then i think that that's good you know it's what changes how we eat you know as 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 people as families as a nation is getting people back in the kitchen on those Tuesday Wednesday Thursday nights yes people might have a treat at the weekend but if we really get you know those kind of you know crux dinners you know people in the kitchen chopping up real ingredients you know having a relationship with the food that they're eating then I think that's where the kind of really important change comes from and I love this idea you were saying of you know these wonderful women who are cooking for you kind of moving slowly in the kitchen and and intentionally you know that's where I want to be with my recipes I, I want people to kind of feel you know feel organize, feel in control, you know, only have a few ingredients, not have loads and loads of pans and only have a couple of simple cooking processes so that even though they might not have ages and ages to cook that 20 or 30 or 40 minutes, however long they've got that night, um, you know, it feels intentional. It feels, you know, it, it, it feels sort of calm and choreographed. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you um, about the kind of the time poor narrative. I've got a bit of a bit of beef with the time poor narrative. I think it's actually created by the food industry to make us buy things that are easy. But actually, you know, Easy Wins is all about your relationship with time. I'm absolutely with you really on on this kind of narrative. I think, you know, it really serves the food industry to tell us we have no time to cook, we have no skills to cook. You know, cooking is too difficult and too complicated. Um and this book is about saying that that's absolutely not the case. I mean, these recipes are quick and I have got, you know, as you say, young kids. So I don't have hours and hours, you know, to spend in the kitchen any night of the week and even at the weekends, really. Um, but I think we have come to expect so much more from our food. You know, we, we want flavour, we want texture, we want, you know, all of these different nuances. And that's kind of, a, you know, a symptom of kind of social media and just this sh- wonderful sharing of food, which I think is a brilliant thing. Um, but we want to spend way less time in the kitchen. So I think actually recipes need to be smarter because, you know, we're all much more aware of the kind of breadth of flavour we, you know, and, and we all want really, really, really great, delicious food, but we're not spending, you know, as long as we used to in the kitchen. And I think I've seen, you know, in, in, in the 20 years I've been cooking as a job, I've seen, you know, the, the landscape of food change almost without recognition. We are spending way, way less time in the kitchen. Um, But I think really so much of good eating is about good shopping, about good buying. And I think part of Easy Wins is about, you know, sort of having this, this, you know, capsule pantry of different ingredients sitting there, sitting on top of your fridge, sitting in your pantry, ready to turn something reasonably simple into something unreasonably delicious, you know, with a tablespoon of harissa, with a jot of mustard, you know, with a bit of miso. I mean, it's interesting when you say you feel really um, strongly uh, that that people need to be in the kitchen and that people need to eat more vegetables. You also feel very strongly about sustainability and about lack of waste and being really mindful about how to eat to save the planet. And you did this in your last book, One Pot Plan Planet, uh, very, very much so. Um, this one is 
is is just as much i think you know it's really interesting that, that right first in it's about actually let's look at the energy use by mindfully uh planning is also about limiting waste you you use the phrase treading more lightly on the planet is that joanna macy that you're following um or do you who do you read who do you follow well yeah so in my last book um i actually spent a lot of time kind of going quite deep in sort of scientific papers and um a lot of areas that weren't really my natural habitat. Um, I'm much more a cook. I'm much more excited about reading about food and flavours. Um, but I felt really that my responsibility as a cook um, and as someone who eats and as someone who I guess has a voice um, about food was to inform myself as, you know, as sort of thoroughly and in, in, in as much of a 360 degree format as, as I could about where food comes from, about the choices that we can make. Um, and so I do, I read a lot, um, um, you know, some books I love on the subject are Jonathan Safran Foer's Eating Animals, which is more a sort of, I guess, slightly philosophical look at um, eating animals. I read a lot of George Monbiot, who, you know, has very strong opinions, but um, most of them, I have to say, um, I think are valid. And I think sometimes people react to them because they are so strong and, and they do feel uncomfortable. But quite a lot of the time, some of the choices we do need to make are a bit uncomfortable and our lifestyle changes. Um, but I, I really felt strongly in one that there are lots of things that we can be doing. I feel like sometimes, you know, the news is very difficult to listen to on climate. Um, and, and, and it feels like there's very few moments of good news. But, um, so I feel like people just want some things that they feel like they can be doing, that they can be practicing every day to make a difference. I think I said in the introduction to that, but we make something like 10,000 decisions a day and a number of those are around food. And actually, if we can empower ourselves to make, you know, smart, sustainable decisions as much as our time, budget, circumstances allow, then, you know, we're always going to feel good about that. And, you know, no one's losing. So you're treading more lightly on the planet, for example, is that has to do with social justice as much as it has to do with carbon footprint, doesn't it? And thinking ahead about not wasting. I mean, just break down what that means for you. So to me, not wasting, um, you know, it, it, uh, is on many different levels. Um, obviously not wasting um, the food that you buy. I mean, after um, eating you know, mostly plants, um, not wasting your food is the second most impactful thing you can do for, you know, in terms of sustainability and for the environment. And also it feels like a thing that everyone can do. I think lots of the decisions around, um, you know, sustainability can involve spending a bit more money or it can involve you living in a certain area or it can involve, involve you being informed in a certain way. But actually not throwing away the food that we buy is something that everyone can do. And it is something that's going to save everyone money. Um, so, I mean, I think that is something that we can really all hold on to. And I love, you know, uh, principles like that, that feel quite democratic, um, that don't require you to go to a posh farmer's market, don't require you to, you know, buy an expensive waste composter or something like that. Um, so, yes. And I think also, you know, wasting energy is another thing. You know, a lot of the cooking in, in Easy Wins and in lots of my books is in one pot or one tray. And, you know, actually when we, you know, use an oven, a hob, a food processor, all of those things, we kind of often don't think about the fact that we're using lots and lots of energy. Um, and so it, it's about not wasting energy. It's also about kind of not overbuying. And I think that's what, you know, Easy Wins is about. You know, we've sort of focused this book around 12 um, ingredients. And actually, if, you, you know, you're, if you're only buying these sort of 12 ingredients, this is my, my you know, loved flavours, my pantry, but you work out what yours are and then, you know, stick to a sort of smaller amount of ingredients. And that means you're going to waste less. 
I mean, it's, it, one of the things that you, you you put in your golden rules, I think, uh, is read the recipe through. Uh, and that will reduce waste. I mean, how many times do you read the recipe and go, oh, God, I can't do that. I'm halfway through it and I've only got, I haven't got the blooming capers or, or, or whatever it is. I mean, it, when we say recipes, some of them are so, so, so simple that actually, you know, you could make it up if you haven't got one ingredient. You're fine. And your first one is ajo blanco. I mean, it's so, so simple. But what? why did you choose this of the 125 food moments you could have chosen in the book? So the ajo blanco is something that um, I learned to cook as a kind of young chef um, when I was working at um, 15 restaurant in London. And I was working with this fantastic chef, Steve Pooley, who's still a dear friend um, and makes some of the most delicious food I've ever eaten. And I remember sort of starting a shift and Steve was over the other side of the kitchen and he was sort of soaking some bread in vinegar, which already seemed weird. And then he put that and some grapes and some almonds and lots of olive oil um, into a food processor with, I think, you know, and whizzed it up and served it cold as a soup with ice. And I remember just thinking, what absolute madness is this? I kind of couldn't, I couldn't get my head around um, what it would taste like and why you would do it. And when I sort of, you know, it was a boiling, boiling July day or, or July or August, but I remember it was absolutely, it was like an inferno in the kitchen. Um, and I went over to sort of try it just before for service as we were all sort of plating up and I just thought, oh my goodness, this is the exact definition of what I want to eat today. It kind of felt nourishing um, and, and so bright and flavourful, but also cool and delicious. And it was just one of those examples of when food completely surprises you, where, where it completely sort of like, you know, sidelines you and you just think, oh my goodness, like, who came up with this? Who soaked bread and who put the grapes in? And 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 it was just one of those really, really brilliant moments in food um, that that just kind of lit me up, you know. And there are so many of those moments I can remember. But that's why it felt so exciting to include it in this book. Not only is it such a, a brilliant um recipe to show off how how vinegar is used and actually how olive oil is used which are two of the ingredients in the book but it's it, it, it's a real sort of lesson in balancing sweet and sour um and kind of creaminess and richness and brightness um yeah i love it Working in a restaurant, you are, I was just, I run food writing retreats um, and we had somebody from Boca de Lupo last week and she's just, she was talking about watching the chefs in action. She's a chef there, but she's just learning, soaking it all up. And as you describe that moment, it's very similar to what she was telling us. At what point do you say, okay, I um, I could call myself a, sh a proper chef now and start playing around with your own flavours. Well, I think that definitely took me a while um, to feel like I was a proper chef. I'm someone who likes to sort of, uh, you know, stand back, observe, check things out and then dive in. Um, so I definitely felt, you know, when I first started working in the kitchen that all of my, you know, chefs you know senior chefs in the kitchen had this amazing knowledge of all these different things um but now I know them as people I know they were kind of just having a go a lot of the time and I think really being a cook and a chef is just about honing those instincts um and and about experimenting and about trying the best chefs I know are the chefs that experiment aren't afraid you know to cross uh, borders or countries or boundaries in the kitchen and um you know this chef steve who's a friend of mine we were essentially in an italian restaurant but he was making this spanish recipe and um and yeah i i, I think it's 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 I, I see myself definitely much more as a cook now than a chef. I think if I went into a kind of professional kitchen now, my chopping speed would not be up to scratch. <laughs> um and i you know, you know, I think I would be definitely a bit off the pace. Um but a proud cook and and a cook who was once a chef. And you know, to follow that on, the way that you talk about the crispy bottom of your lemon artichoke and butter bean paella, I was thinking 
Yes, that's that's why I like paella. Tell us about why you chose that as your second food moment. It's genius. Yeah, paella is one of those food moments of the year. You have all those, to me anyway, we, we have those food moments that punctuate the year. It's the making the elderflower cordial in May. It's, you know, the making the birthday cakes in November birth. Both my boys have um, have birthdays in November. It's about kind of, you know, my birthdays in April. There's always lovely, loads of lovely spring veg about. And it's those food moments that punctuate the year. And this kind of paella, you know, when I cook it, has become something that punctuates our summer and is something that we do every year. And I love that and I cherish it. And I think those kind of... Um, the sort of little bedrocks of the year, those little food moments, the things I want to kind of create for my sons and have them remember and have them as, you know, little traditions. But it's the first kind of savoury, actual full dinner recipe that my son um, felt like he got really excited about. And of course, I didn't teach it to <laughs> He went to this brilliant um, place um, near where we live called the Hackney School of Food. Um, and it is a sort of community um, cooking, teaching place for children and adults, actually. Um, and it's just the most amazing place. There's this brilliant teacher there called Tom and um, he, his whole class there and they made paella and he came back pronouncing paella so perfectly which I was impressed with first of all and he was sort of came back and he was telling me about the recipe and he was so proud that this was his recipe that he'd done this himself and he was trying lots of flavors in this paella that he would definitely not have tried at home and it was a real lesson to me and sort of well the power of a good teacher number one but also the power of um you know of of, of him having his own agency because obviously food and recipes are my thing. So for him to come back with this recipe, it was, it was such a lovely thing. And we've since made it again and again and again. And actually, the smart way they make paella with children is in, in the Hackney School of Food, is they sort of bake it in a in a baking tray rather than in a big paella pan, which which actually is a really really smart hack. And and um, I've actually stuck with the traditional sort of way of doing it in 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 the book this time because I love that crispy bottom and I think the best way to get that crispy bottom is with a pan. Um but yeah also it's something that's really dear to my heart because every summer um we ha we we go on holiday to Spain with some dear friends and my son's best mate and spend a couple of weeks kind of in the sun um and every year sort of like we, we do paella one night and I I cook it, you know, on the balcony, the sun on my back, margarita in hand. Um, and we use one of the really, really thin paella pans and a proper, uh, a proper gas burner. And we, and we get the best crispiest bottom. You know, I can't get it quite as good at home, but I think the recipe I've put in the book is, is not far off. And I think that soccer at that kind of, um, I'm probably pronouncing that badly so apologies to any um <laughs> anyone who um yeah is a spanish speaker but it's that kind of amazing um crispy 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 bottom really to me is what paella is is about and of course that's an example of one of your 12 heroes the lemon um as was the garlic in your first food moment. Um, so let's just go through those 12 heroes. You've got lemon, olive oil, vinegar, mustard, tinned tomatoes, capers, chilli, harissa, tahini, garlic, onions, miso, all of which I have and use all the time. And then peanut butter. Peanut butter. Tell me about peanut butter. That threw me. I Oh, gosh, that's a bit of a, a, a curveball. Why peanut butter? Well, peanut butter is something I've grown up with. I spent a, a few years living in California when I was when I was younger, and I think those kind of PB and J sandwiches have become something that um, was part of my childhood, and, and and I and I still make for my sons. And it's something that we eat a lot of in our house. We sort of have a gigantic tub of it, and um, it's something my my sons love, but also I love the flavour of. Um, I love the kind of richness of it. I love the kind of um, depth that it brings both to savoury and to sweet dishes. Um, it's also something that kind of sits there without really going bad over time. Whereas if you had a bag of nuts, um, the tendency for those to kind of, you know, the oils to go funny in those and those not to taste good, um, you know, that, that will happen much quicker than it will, you know, a pot of peanut butter. Um, so, yeah, I love peanut butter from kind of, you know, 
Indonesian gado gado to kind of stirring into sort of uh, soups. I make a peanut and tomato soup um, or into into curries. Um, there's a brilliant aubergine and peanut curry in this book that I just um, is one of my absolute favorite things to eat um you know to 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 sort of sweets and sundays there's a there's a very quick chocolate and peanut butter sauce in easy wins that you know you can drizzle over ice cream um i love it actually in a little sunday with fresh cherries that's how we've made it in the book but it's so versatile and it honestly it, you know it, it it's the work of two minutes um and you've got something that feels like a really decadent delicious you know pudding you know with a decent tub of ice cream um so yeah maybe a bit of a curveball for some people but not for me it really feels like you know one of the ingredients that is at the beating heart of my kitchen as does capers um capers yes absolutely one of my 12 heroes too but caper and chocolate ice cream your third food moment do explain so caper and chocolate ice cream i mean this is a wild combination. I know that. Um, but I love ice cream. I spent some time as a young chef in Italy and, you know, my highlight was going to the gelaterias. Um, that's what I would do with my money or my break. And, 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 and I've, I, I've sort of never stopped since then. And one of those trips to Italy, um, I went to a gelateria and I remember eating caper and chocolate ice cream. I remember thinking, this is absolutely wild. I've got to try this. Had a spoonful of it. Of, of it. Um, and I just remember it being this very delicious rounded chocolate ice cream. Um, and then I sort of forgot about it for years and years and years and years. And then when it, I came to writing this book and writing about capers and, and, and each ingredient in the book, you know, there's sort of 12 to 15 recipes on each ingredient. So I wanted, as well as sort of the real sort of staple recipes for each of those ingredients I also wanted to make sure that I was sort of stretching you know the cooks who wanted to be stretched and, and giving people something a bit unexpected and so this caper and chocolate ice cream kind of popped into my head and I thought I must put this amazing ice cream into the book um but I'm not uh, you know, a pastry chef. I'm not an expert at all on ice cream. Um, so I leaned towards my friend Kitty Travers, who to me is the, you know, she's like an ice cream sort of savant. I feel like she sort of gets in my head and creates the ice cream flavours I never knew I even wanted to eat. And then I go into a, you know, her ice cream place or her shop and think, oh my goodness, this is like the flavour of my dreams. Um, and so I asked her if she knew about this ice cream number one and of course she did because she knows everything about ice cream but she also had a recipe for it and she very very kindly um let me use it in the book and it's so good um you know the capers and chocolate do something similar to what kind of caramel and salt do together and I, I mean some salted caramel now is so ubiquitous it's absolutely everywhere um but the capers you don't, it doesn't taste capery just have this lovely rounded kind of deep saltiness and slight umami that is bought um that makes this kind of the richest most delicious um chocolate ice cream i think i've ever eaten alchemy total alchemy that's what's always exciting you can never ever get bored of alchemy it's a magic moment your fourth and final food moment is the frizzled spring onion and olive oil dip there's always one recipe that kind of sums up the book doesn't it it sort of stands stands apart from all the others in terms of your memories and you ate this on the shoot as well it's you you've dedicated the book to your little boy is that why you chose it is it is it sort of imbued with the sort of the spirit of the book for you absolutely i think this recipe does have um, something special about it and it does feel like it sort of says this book easy wins to me um, of course it's so special um, that we made it at Eska's first birthday I mean I spent a long time trying to um, you know have another baby after we had my son and so Eska's arrival was really um quite miraculous actually and then he spent a bit of time in the sort of neonatal intensive care so you know when he arrived also it was kind of you know every child is special but he and and of course my my son Dylan he's eight is incredibly special but there was there was a real um you know we'd really wanted 
this little boy and he arrived and it was so special. So getting to a year, having his first birthday all together with all family around with food I'd cooked um, was so brilliant. And the fact that, you know, he is woven into the tapestry of this book because I wrote all the recipes while he was pregnant. And then we 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 shot all of the um, book at my house and at my little studio I have down the road, you know, while I was breastfeeding him, while, you know, I was sort of running up and downstairs in a boiling hot summer. And, and, and so, you know, that memory of his first birthday and that, that spring onion dip I made with, you know, a, a sort of delicious vegetarian chili, loads of corn tacos and, and, you know, all of these things, everyone standing around on a November day, you know, spooning this warming stuff into their mouths with this really bright, exciting, frizzled spring onion sort of yogurt on the side just feels really, yeah, it feels really lovely. And also it's a recipe I love, you know, it came out of me sort of thinking about olive oil and thinking about the wonderful ways in which you can use olive oil in different ways. And it got me thinking about, you know, spring onion oil, which is is a you know is used and made in Chinese cooking and from there I sort of went over to thinking about how delicious that would be with chili with turmeric with sugar and how that then you know might be this rich you know yellow and and a red and green from the spring onions oil that then needed a, a sort of neutral base to sit on and to me that felt like yogic would also be delicious drizzled over feta or some ricotta it's about the coming to Together. It's about those moments where, where, whether it's on the shoot when, you know, everyone's, you know, around and the photographers there, you know, the lovely people who are helping me cook were there. Um, you know, my husband's there, my son's there. And, um, you know, we're all sort of diving into the dip at the end of a long day's work and everything in the world seems right. Or, you know, it's, it, it's that going back to that birthday party and sort of standing back, you know, in the corner of the room, seeing my son, seeing the people I love, you know, all so happy and nourished by this food. I think it's, it's one of those kind of full circle moments where you feel like everything is right in the world thanks for listening do head to extra bites on my substack to get a taste of some of anna's recipes from easy wins and i will see you next week